different wavelengths of light and um, how the matter behaves. And that gives you uh, insights into its inherent composition, <coughs> structure, and properties. Okay. So let's go on with chapter one, matter measurements and testing. Calculation. Um, so some fundamental definitions that you'll need to know. Chemistry is the study of matter. So matter, what is matter? Matter is everything. Everything is matter. nothing, okay? So chemistry is the study of everything except for nothing, okay? So except for like a vacuum. And <laughs> its inherent properties, its chemical properties, what it can turn into, what it can uh, come from, uh, how it behaves, its physical properties, what does it look like, um, what's its density, what's its state of matter, that type of stuff. Um, the changes it undergoes and the energy associated with those changes. How much energy does it take? How much does it not? So like I said, chemistry is the study of everything. Matter, what is matter? Anything that has mass and takes up space. So composed of atoms, bonded together in specific arrangements, um, so the table, that's matter. The air is matter. Water is matter. Anything. Anything is matter. A uh, property, what is a property? Well, a property is a characteristic of a substance. So, like, a property of my jacket would be that it's brown. Okay? Or that it's got little lint balls on it. Okay? Um, Energy, what is energy? Well, it's the capacity to do work or cause change. So, how does that relate to chemistry? Well, of course, when I put gasoline in my car, uh, my car uh, sparks that gasoline with the spark plug and uh, makes a chemical reaction happen and changes that gasoline into carbon dioxide um, and water. Uh, giving a little bit of energy off, and that energy actually helps propel the car. Okay. So energy is an inherent property of, um, or an inherent uh, subject matter of chemistry. So, what are the divisions of chemistry? So chemistry, chemistry is a very big subject. And as you can imagine, just like if you said, I don't know, I'm a football player, right? That doesn't fully describe what that player does, right? He could be a quarterback, he could be a running back, he could be this or that or whatever, okay? So just like in chemistry, if I say I'm a chemist, well, all that, all of that is true, it doesn't really describe exactly what I do. Personally, I'm an organic chemist, but um, there are many other types of chemistry. Okay, and many other types of chemistry. So organic chemistry, which like I said is my personal favorite, is the study of matter containing carbon. So really that's uh, quite a small subset of all matter, but um, quite important, especially to you guys, because humans are organic beings, okay? Most, uh, most of you are going to go into the allied health field, so um, it's good to know a little bit about organic chemistry. And we'll hit on that more towards the end of the course. Inorganic chemistry, on the other hand, is the study of matter containing non-carbon elements. So anything that doesn't have carbon in it is known as an inorganic substance. Anything that has carbon, organic, anything that doesn't, inorganic. Analytical chemistry, well, that's an analysis of matter to determine the identity and composition of that matter. So an analytical chemist would be somebody down at the water treatment plant seeing how much, I don't know, heavy metals is going into the water system. And they're just analyzing 
They're taking out samples and uh, figuring out concentrations. Okay? So that would be like an analytical chemist. A physical chemist is a chemist who studies the way that the matter behaves at the subatomic level. Okay, so we haven't gotten into atoms yet. We will in a second. Don't sit here. Nobody sit here. Um, <coughs> composed of other things, okay? Subatomic particles. Particles known as electrons, protons, and neutrons, okay? And in fact, what you'll find is that even those particles are composed of other particles, which we won't even touch, okay? Very, very uh, theoretical stuff. And of course, biochemistry uh, is the study of life at the molecular level. So the types of chemistry we'll really be focused most on in this course are inorganic chemistry for the most part, uh, then organic chemistry for a little bit, biochemistry for a little bit, and a tiny, tiny bit of physical chemistry uh, within the whole of the course. Analytical chemistry, actually, uh, you'll be doing a little bit of this in the lab. So um, you'll get exposure to all of these types of chemistry. And I really think uh, that it's uh, valuable. And I think we'll, we'll have a good time with it, actually. So, OK. So what can you do with chemistry? Right? Since it's the study of everything, right? you can imagine that you can do a lot of things with it. And as you can imagine, if you look around in most of your courses, there's probably not so many people in your lecture class, right? That's because in chemistry, everybody has to take it who's doing any sort of science, any sort of health, any sort of anything. And in fact, you can see health sciences, microbiology, physiology, botany, nutrition are all quite similar but mostly unrelated uh, disciplines. Um, and in fact, you can put a number of other disciplines, probably anything that you in particular are going for. I know that I've gotten quite a quite a bit of emails from you guys already, and I don't think anybody said they were going into botany, but um, most people health sciences. But you can imagine some other things that you may or may not be going into um, that do have to do with chemistry. So chemistry is known as the central science. And hopefully by the end of this uh, class, you will um, fall in line with that sort of thing. Okay. So the funny thing about chemistry, actually, I don't know about funny, um, interesting, uh, is that we'll talk about it for the whole term. We'll talk about it, talk about what it looks like. We'll talk about how it behaves. We'll talk about all of these things. But we'll never actually see atoms. We'll never actually see a reaction on like right in front of us, like two things colliding, making something else. We may get some sort of uh, ability to, to discern that a reaction did happen, like a color change or a flame or something like that. But we're going to have to really come to terms with the fact that we can't really see these things, so we're going to have to represent them as uh, pictures and models and things like that, which aren't actual reactions, of course. Like if I So that's what we're going to do a lot, is that we're going to pretend that what we have in our hand actually does look and behave as if it were at the um, atomic level or molecular level. Okay? So what we'll find is that we're going to be using a variety of representations or models uh, 
throughout the class that describe what we believe happens on the molecular or atomic level. Okay? So let's look at uh, some of these models. Of course, if you look at that, you would tell me, oh, that's a boiling glass or beaker of water, right? But it's not really, right? It's not really a boiling beaker of water. It's a really just a picture, right? That's right, right? It's a model, okay? So that's what you want to get into the habit of thinking, okay? Like this. This is an enzyme, okay? No, it's just a picture, okay? It's just a model of the way that enzyme looks. We can't actually see that enzyme because they're too small. Our eyes can't see them. In fact, light, its wavelength is too long, and that's why even if we got the most powerful light microscope, we couldn't see atoms because they're very, 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 very tiny. And in fact, uh, only recently have people been able to see atoms, if you will, by methods that um, are kind of a secondary method. Uh, they say, well, since we're getting these sort of sy symbols back from uh, like our electron tunneling microscope, it must look like this, okay? And then we can get a picture of what an atom looks like. Uh, that may not make sense to you right now. I'm sure <coughs> down the road it will. You'll watch this lecture, I'm sure, like 20 times. Anyway, so here's some models of water molecules. Here's another model of two enzymes coming together, binding together. This would be like, I don't know, a... a like if you took, um, if you had a headache or something, you took some aspirin, you know, your as the aspirin molecule would bind to your enzyme and make your headache go away. And here's a organic structure, okay? So this really is not an orga uh, organic molecule, it's just, again, a representation. Okay, so one thing I want to, and look at this, these are just words. This is describing a chemical reaction, okay? H2O liquid goes to H2O gas. Okay, so in fact, that's not describing a reaction, that's describing um, the process of evaporation, okay, or boiling. Okay, so the one thing I want you to always remember, and I know it seems obvious, but sometimes you'll forget, okay, is that these are not actually the actual things. They're just representations of things, okay? And it's because we can't actually put our hands on them. We can't put, actually see them. So it's really a lot of, okay, you're just going to have to believe me. We're just going to have to jump into this and say, okay, this is the way things work. And the thing is, is I know, I know it's going to take a leap of faith, but I've been studying this for a long time, and I realize that these truths, you know, have just keep coming back and back and back. So they, they must behave this way, okay? Okay, so let's go back to matter. So matter is anything that has mass and takes up space. We've said that plenty of times now. So that, that means what? Okay, well, if it's something, it has to be composed of something, right? And matter, all matter actually is composed of atoms bonded together, or it could, I mean, it, they don't have to necessarily be bonded, but composed of atoms bonded together in specific arrangements and compounds, okay? So here's some representations of matter. A penny, that's matter, okay? If you can feel it and weigh it, it's matter. Okay. Nickel, razor blade, paper. Okay. See this guy, this guy there, that's matter. That person, that's matter. His hang glider there, that's matter. Those clouds, that's matter. And in fact, the air that he's riding on is matter. In fact, if air wasn't matter, this guy would just fall there, okay? In fact, what's happening is the wings of that hang glider are actually resting on the air, just like if it, you were in a boat, right, and you were sailing around, resting on the water. That's exactly what's happening here. And in fact, that's why we can fly. That's, our, that's why we have planes that can fly, right? Or that's why birds can fly, okay? Yeah, I, don't think, I don't think we can fly. <laughs> okay, so we talked about a little bit about properties. What is a property? Like, my coat is brown, right? My hair is brown. Um, well, let's talk a little bit more detail. Physical properties. So there's two types, two um, classes of properties, if you will. One is physical properties, 
the other is chemical properties. Okay? Let's go over physical properties right now. Physical properties are those properties that are observable when the substance is in isolation. Okay, what does that mean? If I'm not reacting it with something else. Okay? So, if I look at this, it's not reacting with anything right now, so we can describe its physical properties. Okay? Um, it's in isolation. It's not very reactive substance, so it's not like burning up in the air. Okay? Um, so, some physical properties of this, well, so some examples of physical properties are color, electrical conductivity, state of matter, melting point, boiling point, density, solubility, malleability, the, how easily can it be deformed. So, like we can describe the malleability of this thing or the ductility of this. How, how easy do you think it would be to make this thing into a wire? That wouldn't be very easy, huh? Or the malleability, if I, how easy would it be to smash it into a, like a, a plane? Uh, not very easy, right? Can't do it. So, uh, not very malleable, right? Not very ductile. Uh, it's white, okay? It's solid, solid. Um, the melting point and boiling point would be a little more difficult to figure out, but um, a solubility, if I had some water, I could throw this thing in there and see if it dissolves, okay? So you can, if you've got a mixture of two or more different um, substances, a lot of times you'll be able to separate them by physical properties. Okay. So you can imagine if you had a sand metal system, a sand iron system, with sand and iron mixed together, it would be uh, annoying, but you could do it. You could pick out every piece of sand and every piece of uh, metal, right, and put them in two separate containers, okay? That would be separation by physical properties. Look at this. Here, you can separate it by other physical properties. Um, well, we don't have... Uh, magnetic properties here, but that's another physical property, obviously. Okay? The iron and the sand have different uh, <coughs> types or different uh, magnetic uh, properties. Therefore, the magnet is able to take the iron filings away from the sand. Okay? So, if you can separate things by physical means, those are physical properties. Okay? So, does that make sense to everybody? can separate it by physical means. Those are physical properties. It would be like if you had a uh, sand and sugar mixture. What you could do, potentially, is put that mixture, put water into that mixture, stir it up, and then filter out all the sand, right? And then uh, the stuff that would come through your filter would just be sugar water. Then you could evaporate that water and you would have sand in one thing and sugar in the other thing, right? So that would also be separation by physical properties. Remember, we said solubility is a physical property. Solubility would, it means the ability for something to dissolve in something else, okay? So, of course, that would be referring to the sugar in this instance, and, in fact, the sand, and not being able to be dissolved in water, okay? So that would also be separation by physical properties. So anything you can do to separate these things physically and get those same substances out, that's separation by physical properties. Okay. So, physical properties, we talked about um, state of matter being a physical property. Okay? Well, there are actually four states of matter, three of them we're going to learn of in this class. Okay? Those three are solid, liquid, and gas. You see that? So the, the lake is liquid. So for ice, for water, I mean, it's got three different um, states of matter, just like anything does. Uh, we 
call them all differently for water because we're so used to them in water. But um, ice is solid water. If we melt that ice, it becomes liquid water, which we're uh, familiar with as water. And if we heat that stuff up really hot, then it becomes steam. All of those things are still water, right? I can take that ice, drink it, whatever. You know, I can take the water, drink it. I can take that steam, cool it down, and drink it. It's all the same stuff, okay? So it's just a physical change is what's happening. It's not a chemical change. I'm not changing it into another substance, okay? It's the same substance still. Okay, so let's look in more detail at these three states of matter. As you see, the solid, why is a solid a solid? Why is a liquid a liquid? Why is a gas a gas, okay? So what we're doing is we're taking this solid, going to a liquid, then going to a gas. This, this would just be, like if I had an ice cube, I could put it on in a pot on the stove, heat it up gradually, 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 it would turn to water, and then it would turn to steam, right? And then it wouldn't be in the pot anymore. In fact, it would be all over the um, room. So how come it does that? At a very low energetic state, which is what um, taking temperature away from something does, so if you freeze something, you're actually lowering its energy state, okay? Uh, what you find is particles become very, very close together. And they organize themselves, they arrange themselves in such a way as to where it's the most favorable for them to sit. Okay, they kind of kind of wedge inside of each other and they put their what you'll find eventually is that molecules have positive portions and negative portions. So they kind of align themselves like little magnets would with the positive being next to the negative of the next guy, okay? So they kind of arrange themselves very orderly, okay? And that's what happens in a solid, is that particles are close together and organized because they don't have very much energy to break away from each other, okay? When you give them more energy, i.e. increase the temperature, okay? So temperature and energy are the same thing, okay? Let's, let's get that one thing straight. You'll You'll forget and be reminded of many, many times in this class, okay, that you just got to realize that the more you increase the temperature, you just, all you're doing is feeding those molecules energy, okay, or if you decrease the temperature, you're taking energy away from those things, okay? So when we give them more energy, what happens? Well, the molecules no longer become organized, right? So in, in a solid, they still, they still move very slightly, so they just vibrate next to each other, okay? Because they're trying, they really don't like to be next to each other. They'd re really rather to be rolling around, flying away from each other. But they don't have very much energy, so they're like little magnet forces take over, okay? So in a solid, they're actually just vibrating, 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 so they have very, very little energy. When we heat them up more, what happens? They vibrate more, vibrate more, vibrate more until they start rolling over each other, okay? That's a liquid, when they start rolling over each other. In fact, if anybody has a water bottle, don't do it with your coffee mug, you can turn it upside down and watch the molecules walk, roll all over each other. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what they're doing. That's why a liquid flows, is because these molecules roll and roll all over each other, okay? So we've given those molecules enough energy to do that. In fact, if you took that water bottle, threw it in the freezer in a certain angle or whatever, right, they would freeze, they would stop moving in that particular fashion, right? And they would be very, very organized until you heat them back up, okay? Now, after the liquid, you give these guys more energy, what happens? They, instead of start rolling over each other, they try to break away from each other. They fly off, okay? And in fact, they get so much energy that they're flying as fast as like speeding bullets. They're just like flying, flying, flying. Okay, so as you can see, the liquid only takes up this much volume here, but when they become a gas, they're flying all over the place. They take the volume of the container. 
And in fact, that's the definition of solid, liquid, and gas. Let's go over that. A solid uh, is something that has a defined shape and a defined volume, right? A liquid is something that has a defined volume but an undefined shape. Does that make sense to everybody? A liquid has no shape, right? And a gas has no, no, or it takes the volume of the container and it takes the shape of the container, okay? So a liquid actually takes the shape of the container. So I have a lot to do again. So they're all right here, guys, okay? So define volume, define shape for the solid, define volume, shape of the container for the liquid, and the volume of the container and the volume, or the shape of the container for the gas. Okay, so going this way, that would be increasing in energy, right? Going to the right, and then going to the left would be decreasing in energy. Or we could say we uh, increase the temperature or decrease the temperature, same thing. Notice the organization here, see? The, what you'll find is the little uh, white balls, these are hydrogens, and this is water molecules. Little white pieces of these water molecules are positively charged, partially. The red portions are negatively charged. You see how they're arranged? I mean, if you squint your eyes and if you, uh, once you get the lecture slides, you can tell um, that the positive and negative portions are kind of aligned with each other. Notice this. Notice this is very organized. This is no longer organized anymore. This is a liquid. And now you don't see the positive and negatives being so closely aligned with each other. Okay? And then, of course, the gas, they're just gone, right? They're all gone. Okay? And in fact, three gas particles is probably a lot. It would probably be like a quarter of one you would see or something like that. So solids melt due to an increase in energy and liquids freeze due to the heat. So, I don't know how much more we can talk about this, but a physical change, right, occurs when a substance alters its form but doesn't alter its identity, okay? So, it's like when water goes to ice. It's still water. Okay? It just looks different. So, it didn't change into, I don't know, gasoline. Okay, so I think we've talked about physical properties enough. Let's go on to chemical properties. Chemical properties are properties that are observable when a substance changes or interacts with other substances. So remember we talked about physical properties being where the substance is in isolation. Okay, so now we're interacting other particles with your particular particle of interest and seeing its chemical properties. So look at this thing here. This is a blow-up picture of a sodium chloride crystal. Is anybody familiar with what sodium chloride is? Anybody know? No. Yeah, just tell me. If you if you guys got the answer, got the itch to answer, just tell me because I love when people yell out. Okay. So yeah, it's salt. So it's like table salt. You put it on your, I don't know, mashed potatoes or whatever you put it on, right? But look at the thing. So it's sodium chloride, right? The chemical structure of salt is this, NaCl, okay? Na is sodium, Cl is chlorine, okay? So it's a combination of these two atoms, okay? So we'll, it's actually called a compound. We'll get into compounds in a second. Compounds are uh, at least two different types of atoms put together. Okay, so this would be a compound. Okay, so let's look at the two elements, sodium and chlorine, okay? Sodium, so remember, we can eat this stuff, we eat it all the time, we love it, it tastes good, whatever, right? Sodium itself, the element, okay, so let's look at some of its physical properties, sodium. Sodium is pictured right here. You guys see it? Hard to see, I guess, maybe. Um, silver, right? You guys see that it's silver? 
happen. And in fact, it's in this container with all this electrical tape up over it. Um, it's under oil because if it interacts with uh, oxygen in the air, it explodes. Okay, so if you were to take a piece of sodium and put it on your tongue, you'd probably blow your face off. Okay. <laughs> Of course, if I take a piece of salt and put it on my tongue, what happens? It tastes good, right? So you can see that the physical properties are quite different, right? Let's look at chlorine. Chlorine is in this container here. Physical properties of this are what? It's yellow. It's gaseous, right? Very super duper poisonous. In fact, this is a, um, a good agricultural poison. They've used this uh, in military instances where they wanted to uh, poison a bunch of people, you know, when chemical warfare was still okay. Um, if I were to try to, I don't know, be in a room of chlorine, I would keel over, okay? So both this thing here and this thing, chlorine and sodium, the elements, will kill me, okay? They could injure me or hurt me back, right? But if I look at sodium chloride, right, I eat it all the time. In fact, I probably ate some this morning, you know. Why is that? It's because the compound sodium chloride and the two elements, sodium and chlorine, have different properties, okay? They have different physical properties. In fact, the chemical properties of sodium and chlorine are such that if you put them together, they will react to form a compound that's completely different than them. Okay? So, hopefully everybody sees... Okay, so let's drop chlorine. So this is an element, too. So it's an element and a molecule, as a matter of fact. This is a compound and a molecule. Well, let's not go with molecule. It's kind of an ionic compound, so it's not that good. Um, but anyway, so this thing has its own physical properties, this guy has its own physical properties, and this guy has its own physical properties, so we're clear with all that, right? When we combine this guy and this guy, though the combination shows their chemical properties, and what happens is a chemical reaction performs this stuff here. And in fact, to be right, we put two and two in front of each other. We'll get to balancing equations and all that later, so you don't have to worry about that. For those of you who are totally confused as to what's going on, okay? Okay, so you can see here, hydrogen and oxygen, of course, both have different properties than water does, but if we put them together, they form a chemical reaction, so that's their chemical properties uh, combining to form water. And you can see some chemical properties when I drop different drops of calcium into this solution that uh, looks for calcium, okay? So it can either get darker or lighter or whatever, okay? So chemical properties, again, are those properties that are observable when a substance changes or interacts with other substances. Does that make sense to everyone? Make sense? Make sense? Okay. Most of you are like looking at me and being like, oh, oh, oh. Does, does it make sense or not? Because we could go over this more, you know? I'd love to. This is my job, you know? I talk about chemistry all day. Okay, so chemical changes. One chemical change we're familiar with is combustion, okay? So, like this fire breathing guy, he puts a bunch of gasoline in his mouth. He lights the gasoline, what does that mean? He's actually using oxygen, interacting oxygen with that gasoline, and then blowing it out, forming carbon dioxide and water. Okay, that's that chemical reaction that's occurring. Okay. Oxidation, the motorcycle here. Uh, it used to be iron, now it's turned to iron oxide. Because the oxygen in the atmosphere has been interacting with it for so long that it's rusting it. Okay. Iron oxide is rust, okay? So that's the reaction going from iron plus oxygen to iron oxide. So, what is a chemical change? A chemical change is the process of rearranging, removing, replacing, or adding atoms to produce new substances. 
So that should have been clear, but here we're just talking about it definitely. We're defining it right now, okay? So substances change in identity, right? They become a different substance. Remember, this will blow my face off. This taste good, okay? <laughs> Keep remembering that stuff. <coughs> Here's another chemical reaction. Magnesium is a silver, well, this is a magnesium turning, so it's a silver-like kind of string. Uh, has anybody ever lit magnesium before? Yeah, it can bring this super bright light. Yeah, super duper bright. And that, what you're doing is you're combining oxygen and magnesium. So that lighting of it, the lighting of it is just giving it enough energy to go. Okay, that's the energy portion that we were talking about before. We're going to get to that way later, but do you, I want you to realize that the lighter is doing nothing except for increasing the temperature. Whoops. Okay. And getting, getting the oxygen and magnesium to get all riled up to start smashing <coughs> into each other. Okay. And then afterwards, what do we have? We don't have a magnesium turning anymore. We just got dust right? This magnesium oxide dust. Okay? So that's a comparison again of physical and chemical properties. So this is kind of like ashy and this is really silver. Okay? So I want you to perform uh, this uh, problem with me. Do this problem with me. So classify, if you will, each of the following as either a chemical or physical property. Color, uh, chemical, or physical property? Physical. Physical, yeah. What about flammability? <laughs> chemical, yeah, that's a weird one, but it's chemical, yeah. What about hardness? <laughs> physical, okay? You guys getting this stuff? Okay. What about odor? Ah, uh, you, you might think so, it's a weird one. Yeah. So the odor, it, it only has to do with the structure, okay? So the structure of a molecule gives it its odor. So it's in, it's not interacting with anything else. In fact, the, so it's kind of convoluted or nuanced, right? So the act of smelling it and realizing what it smells like is a chemical property, okay? But it really is, it is really physical. Odor and taste, that's why I have these up there. Odor and taste are physical properties, okay? Remember, odor and taste have to do with the structure. Anything that has to do with the structure is a physical property. What about chemical or physical change? Boiling water to become steam, what is that? Physical change. Why? Because steam is the same thing as water, right? It's just in a different physical state. What about butter turning rancid? Chemical. Why, why do you say that? When you eat butter afterwards, does it taste the same after it's rancid? No. no. The structure is changed, okay? So actually what's happened to that butter is being uh, oxidized, okay? The oxygen in the atmosphere is getting, that's why you cover your butter up and put it in the refrigerator. Why do you put it in the refrigerator? To keep the energy down, okay? That's what you're doing. What are you doing when you heat up your Salisbury steak banquet dinner in the microwave? You're doing a chemical or a physical change. Chemical change, right? You're heating those molecules up to cook that beef, right? It's not a, it doesn't, it's not a cow anymore, right? It's a cooked steak, right? Or it's not even a raw steak anymore, it's cooked. You can't, the one thing you want to think about with chemical changes is you can't get them back to the original substance, okay? So can I get rancid butter back to regular butter? No. Uh -huh. Can I get steam back to boiling water? Yeah. Or water? Yeah. What about burning of wood? Is that a chemical or a physical change? Mm -hmm. Chemical. Why is that? Because you can't take that ash and put, make a tree out of it again, can you? Well, I can't, you know. I <laughs> mean, yeah. What about mountain snowpack melting in spring? Physical change. And decay of leaves in winter? Can I get those leaves back after they decay? No way. So what is it? Chemical. Good job, guys. Okay, so before we leave, let's talk about molecules really quick, okay? So a molecule of pure, pure substance, guys, this is what I've at least a minute, uh, is a 
substance that only has one component, okay? So H2 gas, H2O liquid, or AU, that's gold, sorry. Okay? So you can see here, this container only contains oxygen, right? So that's a pure substance, okay? This container only contains carbon monoxide. That's a pure substance, okay? This container only contains carbon dioxide. That's a pure substance. If we look at the air, right, the air contains what? Carbon dioxide, water, nitrogen, oxygen. Is the air a pure substance? No. What we consider that is a mixture of substances, okay? So there's a difference. Pure substance and mixture. And the last thing we'll go over is what is a molecule? A molecule is the smallest particle of a pure substance. So if we look at this picture here, that's an oxygen molecule, that's an oxygen molecule, that's an oxygen molecule, that's an oxygen molecule, that's an oxygen molecule. So when we talk about pure substance, we're talking about the bulk of the thing is the pure substance. When we're talking about molecules, we're talking about the individual particles within that bulk, okay? So thanks for being so attentive, guys. Please do not pack up a minute early. I can't stand that, okay? So from now on.